Welcome to The Good Word. My name is Vincent Goodwill, Senior NBA Reporter, Yahoo Sports. We are part of the Ball Don't Lie podcast. Get us wherever you get your podcast. It is a late Saturday night, which means early Sunday for some of you, depending on when John Gennaro gets this up. This is my man's first time on this here podcast, but we kick it every Sunday somewhere else. My man James Edwards III, he is not the son of Buddha Edwards. He is just James Edwards III, senior NBA writer for The Athletic. He covers the Pistons, and he does a real good job doing it. James, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, man. I appreciate you uh, having me on this podcast. I know I've been making jokes here and there that we do our own podcast together, and I see you once a week, and you still haven't asked me to be on here, but I'm honored after a big moment in uh, world basketball that I got the text like, hey, you got some time tonight. I was like, of course, anything for you, Vinny. Look, it's a big night in beige history. So I figured that in honor of the beiges that you would be the best person. <laughs> the funny to come thing on. is I don't think you're joking. I think there's <laughs> I didn't see the, the the show script. So there's probably a bunch of beige stuff about to happen. That, that actually makes sense now. But go ahead. I'll let you cook. <laughs> I'm not, it's not, it is, I'm not I that even bad. Think about I promise. that. I'm I'm not that bad. James <laughs> is is a resident, uh, shall we say, chapter member of Steph Curry Hive. He yes. thinks that Steph Curry is the greatest player to ever play the game. Now is not the day to have the argument because he was hitting shots that only the greatest player in the game could hit as the U.S. beat France 98-87 in a gold medal game out there. Like, James, I don't know if it was ever in doubt, right? Mm-mm. No. I don't know if it's ever really in doubt, but it was very competitive and compelling throughout. LeBron named the Olympics MVP. Steph had a great semifinals and a great finals. It just looked like theater out there. And I'm guessing that's what you saw, too. Yeah, it was it was some of the most fun basketball I've watched in a while because, I mean, you look around the court, and especially in this final game, everybody who we deem as – the best players in the league kind of did what they're known for, right? I think if we look at the Team USA roster, I mean, every, the fifth might be different for some, but it's Steph, LeBron, KD, Embiid. And I think I think Anthony Davis is the fifth best player on the team personally, but I, I obviously leave that up to, uh, to for people to argue. But if you look just through that game, everybody did what we know for them. There was a moment in, I think, the start of the second half where Embiid was so physical um, and physically imposing and it wasn't flopping like he was getting fouled because they couldn't do anything about it. I thought Anthony Davis sneakily had one of the better games of anybody that played. Like he was really good defensively and I think people forget. I don't know if people forget, but I think we take for they granted. Forget. Just, they forget. Yeah, maybe. Okay, maybe they do forget. Just like he is one of the four best defensive players in the world when he's on the floor. Um, LeBron throughout the whole game, doing what LeBron does, get others involved, picking his spots, rebounding, defending. And I tweeted this and people have talked about it. Like he very much was, he was clearly playing like this is the last time he'll have something of note to play for in his life. Um, KD with the ISOs, like doing what KD does. And then Steph um, bringing it home with masterful shots and and masterful shot making. So we saw the best of the best. And mm-hmm. it was int- it was fun to see it come together to lead to a victory. Uh, and I think that's something that we kind of always wonder, like, well, we get the best talent together. It doesn't always work, blah, blah, blah. But it's like tonight or today, it was like Voltron or trans whatever. It's Voltron's not Transformers, right? I was Somebody told me I was wrong. What's the one when the Transformers come together and they're all like different pieces? I don't know. I feel What's like the, that is Voltron, right? That's what I thought, but somebody told me I was wrong. I'm not, the, I'm not a big s- superhero guy, but what everybody does came together and it led to a one a win. And I thought that was beautiful to watch. Dude, you go back to Thursday where you have Nikola Jokic on the floor. Mm-hmm. And then you fast forward and you have Victor Wimbanyama on the floor. And you could see the future of international basketball, the future of the NBA out there. Like, Victor was devastated, y'all, that they didn't uh, win this game. Like, he did yeah. not look at the USA like, man, this is some insurmountable thing that we cannot overcome he was looking at like hey man these dudes are food and i need to eat and it just didn't happen and it only didn't happen because in large part due to stephen curry and what he done and i think you brought up a great point james when you talked about lebron 
mm-hmm. and I will extend it to Kevin Durant and I'll extend it to Stephen Curry. I don't know what type of real winning they're going to do for the rest of their career if they stay on their respective teams. Yep. So this had to mean a little bit more. Like this was as much a, like, I don't have to carry this, but I want to be excellent. I'm going to be excellent. And you saw LeBron with the triple doubles and and orchestrating, and you could see if LeBron allowed teams to be built around him in a certain way, mm-hmm. how it could work, right? If yep. Kevin Durant were on a more functional and conventional team, I think he we'd still be talking about him as a top three, top five player. Yeah. And Steph is Steph. But Steph's yeah, Steph's probably the best of all three of them still, like closest to his prime out of all yes. three of them, I think. So but but the fact is, it's almost bittersweet in a way, James, that we won't see this, we won't see these guys competing against each other in high stakes, high leverage NBA basketball playoff games. Like that's this is it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is it, it was beautiful for the United States, it was beautiful for Team USA and everything else. But there's also a part that's like, man. This is going to be days going by in a yep. short period of time. You know what I mean? For sure. And I think what I think is also beautiful about it is I think everybody watching, it's not an afterthought. We all were thinking that in the moment. Um, like we were all excited to see those three on the floor for the first time ever, right? Well, not all star game or whatever, right? For right. meaningful basketball. Like that was the storyline carrying this USA basketball team is those three, that era whatever you want to call it, the mid 2000s to the 2020s. Like I challenge any era and I'll, and I'll defer to you a bit here as I was born in 92. Like were there ever three players in the league at their prime as good as those three? Cause we're talking about three, in my opinion, two of them are top five and Kevin Durant's just outside the top 10. Like we're talking three top 15 players of all time. Uh, I am a student of the game and have followed up on things that I was maybe too young or before my time. I I don't know if I feel comfortable saying that there were three players at that level at the same time um, in this sport. I will say this, and this is just at the top of the dome, so forgive me if I'm getting it wrong. Forgive me super, super old heads, right? There's two examples that come to mind. Mm Mm-hmm. One is redeem team is 2009, right? Mm-hmm. Where you have LeBron, who's going to win his first MVP in 2009. Yep. Kobe Bryant, who was going to win his first title without Shaq that year. Mm-hmm. And Dwayne Wade, who finished, I believe, second in MVP voting. And they were all coming off the redeem team of 2008. That was like the catalyst for it. Yep. And LeBron wasn't yet full version of his prime. Kobe Bryant was kind of, beginning to age out of super athletic prime Kobe and Dwayne Wade was giving you the best of everything that he had left. Right. Yep. A greater example would probably be 1987. Michael Jordan, bird magic Mm -hmm. bird was coming off of three straight MVPs. He didn't win a fourth in 87, but he had a better year in 87 than he did in 86. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Magic won the first of three MVPs in four years in 86, 87. That was the year that, that the Lakers switched from basically being a Kareem-led team to a Magic-led team because they lost to Houston in five in the Western Finals where Kareem got his ass kicked by Ralph Sampson and Nakeem Olajuwon. So they said, this Magic, this is your team. And then Michael, in his first season coming off of the foot injury, averaged 37 a game, 37, five and five, like 23 years old, boom. Like, but that's a very... Like my, you know what I mean? Because in 88, very finite, right? Very finite. Birds back started acting up in 88. Exactly. And and Michael sort of started to hit like peak, peak ish MJ. You know what I mean? Like that's the off the top of the dome. I could be wrong, guys. If if I get something wrong, that was the that was the the 87 time was the only other time I was thinking was comparable. Um, And like, and again, I'm I was born in 92, but I always was under the assumption. When that intertwine or intersection of those three happened, Bird was the one declining at that point and probably wouldn't be considered where KD, LeBron, and Steph were from 2010 to 2018 or wherever, yeah, you, 20, yeah. 19, whatever it started to kind of decline just a tad for LeBron, I guess, and even KD with the injuries. The wild thing is LeBron is nowhere near 
the force that he was, <clears throat> this is 2024, he was nowhere near the force that he was 10 or 11 years ago when he was the best version of himself. Mm-hmm. Like defensively, LeBron in 2013, like he, you could put him on anybody for 40 minutes a night and he was going to do it now. You could see it a little bit against Nikola Jokic where Joel Embiid, I was trying to figure out where you were. You know what yeah. I mean? But LeBron right. was guarding Nikola Jokic and basically leaving Embiid to get on the boards. But you can see in spots where LeBron doesn't turn his hips as much. He doesn't react as quick. But he's 40 years old. Like, there's only so much you can realistically, you know what I mean, expect out of it. Mm-hmm. Now, to Joel Embiid, because I really want to tap into this, James. He had moments yep. throughout this entire thing. There were, you know, the game he didn't play. But there were the moments where he looked like, oh, OK, th- this is how he fits. He had his moment against Jokic in that third quarter where or fourth quarter where he was sort of keeping him in it yep. until the big three, you know, took the mantle and said, we got this. Can you imagine, James, how difficult, how different this would have been if Embiid had chosen France instead of USA? Yes, I, I, I think I could because Embiid for his weird of a... Uh, knockout round that he kind of had, like his presence, as I said earlier, and, and you mentioned, like was felt in spot in spots in both games and much needed, whether to keep the team afloat, whether to keep uh, the 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 opponent at, at, within arm's reach or at arm's length. Um, they were they were meaningful spots. They weren't just spots. And but if you put him on that French team, and especially kind of how that team progressed throughout the tournament, where obviously Rudy went to the bench. Uh, they were trying to just get a little bit more uh, offensive juice. That team was not the best offensively throughout the Olympics. Like, and Embiid knows all of those guys, right? That his teammates yeah. currently. Like, if he was like, that's when we would have saw the tricks of the trade. I think against those guys. But I'm with you. I think it would have been very interesting. Um, I think a lot of uh, Americans are glad that Embiid chose the USA. But. I, I am fascinated to see how that front court progresses as we get to 2028. Um, Cause I can't imagine Embiid will be on that team. Uh, just yeah. simply. I mean, they have still to re-recruit young. him again. Right. Well, there's that. And just even you wonder about his body or you wonder about AD's body. Uh, who's also still young. You could see Bam maybe coming back. Like that's a yeah, possibility, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but you need, you need more than that. Uh, but for Embiid to take on this challenge with this roster, it was fun to see because we've just watched Embiid dominate in Philly as the guy and being the hub. And to watch him, to his credit, I thought effortlessly not play anything like he does in Philly. And obviously he knows he hit, that's the case, right? Like it's not a, a shocker to him. But just to watch him do it, like, yeah, it was funky at times. But um I just kind of enjoyed – I enjoy seeing guys in different environments. Like, that's what makes the Olympics fun to me. Like, seeing Devin Booker, yeah, Steph Curry's talking to him, and Devin's just, like, staring him in the eye like it's a like it's a big bro, right? Like, Devin's usually the one talking to people when we watch Devin Booker. And I even thought Devin deferred a lot of good shots just because LeBron was one pass away or Steph was one. Like, that's what fascinates me about the Olympics is seeing guys get out of their comfort zone. And I think you saw everybody get out of their comfort zone except – Steph, KD, and LeBron because they are. They are the comfort zone. They are the comfort zone, exactly. No, I think to some degree, Book, I won't say he played better than Ant, but I thought he did. He fit in. At least the last two games. Yeah, he fit in with the construction of the team and taking the shots that were available to him. And he's not necessarily the guy with all the wiggle anyway, the way Ant is. And Ant had his moments against Rudy Gobert, moments he probably been waiting for for the past <laughs> six or seven months. He saw Rudy on the permanent. He's like, oh, I've been waiting. Food. <laughs> bring that ass out here. Food. Bring, oh, bring your ass. Bring your ass. <laughs> bring that's, your that's, ass. Let me wait, though. Bring your ass. <laughs> like, look, if, if I'm my man, uh, our buddy Yabusele, yeah. I'll tell you this. After he dunked on LeBron... I'd have been like, you remember that scene on White Man? You ever seen White Man Can't Jump? Of course. Right? When they were in like the little tournament and the dudes was like, that's just too easy. He's like, I want to play no more. I want to play. I want to play. I'd have been like that. I want to yeah. play no more. Come sub out. Come sub me out. That's it. Come put this poster in the crib. Have LeBron yeah. sign it right there. Le- like, put it in the like LeBron, you're 40 years old. What you trying to take a charge for, dog? Come on, man. Hey, I respected it. But you, you see they were calling my man uh uh. Baguette, 
Ben Wallace. But yeah, Ben Wallace, I did yeah, see that. I was like, come on, don't, don't do That's that. That's disrespectful. Ben. That's yeah. disrespectful, man. But he was balling and obviously played with the Celtics for uh, for a little bit there. I, I you could tell like obviously everybody was excited. And I got Pistons fans. Says, do we do we have enough? You think we have enough salary cap left to get him? It's like, well, you could kind of see like when he had to go left, like you were like, oh, okay, I kind of see it now. But kudos to him, man. Even shout out to Evan Fournier too, who was atrocious in the first half, and mm-hmm. his shot making honestly is the reason. U.S. kind of butts clinched a little bit there in that second half. Like they started to hit shots, and he was the catalyst for that. That was just a fun basketball game, man. Yeah, man. It James. It was. It wasn't like the 2008 game against Spain was like more butt clinching. You know, mm-hmm. I'm mean? like you never really felt that U.S. was going to lose the game. The game against Serbia was more dire, but yeah. this game, especially when you saw the shot making from Steph. You got to see the crowd get into it. You saw everybody, like, you know, you saw the Carmelos sitting there. You saw a guy that looks like the Cheetos man sitting there. I don't know who he was. I heard, I think he's a former, uh, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think y'all let y'all figure that out. Like, everybody that was, you know what I mean? Dwayne Wade on the call, our, our yeah. friend Zora Stevenson was on the call. Like, it just felt like an event. Yeah. And for Steph to be the guy to polish everything off, it just felt fitting for him to get his first gold medal because it seemed like it just meant that much to him in that moment. And it just seemed like a movie. Like everybody says, oh, it's going to be a movie. No, this was actually a friggin' movie. And it was like something really compelling to see in real time. We were all watching it together. It was just something really, really amazing to see. But we're going to pause for a minute, pay some bills. And when we right, be right back, we're going to talk about Kevin Durant and where he fits in these greater Olympic discussions. We're back here on The Good Word with James Edwards of The Athletic. James, I think you know, I think we kind of sit in agreement on where Kevin Durant sits as far as his skill set, as far as like if you need a shot and there's one player you need for a shot, it's probably Kevin Durant to get. And that's with apologies to Michael Jordan. That's apologies to Kobe Bryant. That's apologies to anybody else. Right. It's probably Kevin Durant. If you're saying, give me a shot and I don't have any other details, it's probably KD. Mm-hmm. Yes. How do we contextualize KD as an Olympian with him being the all time Olympic scorer and his fourth gold medals? And we kind of poo poo gold medals like it doesn't you know, like it doesn't matter. But I think it does matter in this case, especially considering these gold medals ain't been easy. Yep. But how do we contextualize KD as an Olympian for all these Olympic runs that he's been on? No, I mean, listen, the resume is as good as it can be. I'm, this is always tough for me to like think about and answer because I don't, like, when I think of KD, I don't, very few moments ever, like, it takes a while for me to get to like USA basketball moments just because it's four years spaced out. Um, the expectation is that the team will win. It's, it's, it's really hard for me to like, there's no, uh, filing cabinet in my head of KD USA basketball, right? Like I, I couldn't uh, properly describe a moment be uh, previous to this this year, but the accolades are there, right? And yeah. I think it's also a testament to a guy who has had um some some serious injuries and yet continues to play at a high level and continues to play regularly, right? Like he didn't have to play at this Olympics like I'm sure KD as much as LeBron could have used this time off right like it's it's very much um somebody who we hear it all the time he loves to hoop Mm -hmm. and that's where that's why he's that's why he was in Paris because that's what it comes down to when it comes to KD but I mean I'm I'm comfortable saying the the best Olympian because the resume speaks for itself but you could whoever the second best Olympian is right like whether that's Jordan or even Mello, right? Or whatever. Right. I have more Mello Team USA memories than I think I do KD, but that's mm. maybe because of just like a time period in my life when I'm I was young 20s and a teenager. Um the Olympics meant more. Week. Yeah, it felt like it meant more. Now it's I enjoy it because it's it's the middle of summer and there's no other basketball going on. I'm not the biggest like Olympian Olympic basketball world basketball guy. Like, I'll admit that I'm not. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the resume speaks for itself. So uh, it's hard to argue with that. I guess what are your thoughts? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. It's a weird thing to contextualize Olympic basketball because you have to contextualize it within competition. Right. You know what I mean? Like you have to say, all right, 
the world started catching up when. Yeah. And we thought in 1992, the world was going to be 30 years away. And by 2004, like 12 years is not a long period of time. By 2004, the world had caught up. Don't get me wrong. The U.S. did not send its best team out there. It didn't send like Tracy McGrady, who was a scoring champ, I believe, in 2004. Kobe Bryant, who had his issues. You know, like that sort of thing. Like Tim Duncan was the best player, but you'd be hard pressed to name the second best player. But the larger point is the world caught up really quick, theory or quicker than we thought they would. And when Kevin Durant showed up, the world was already feeling like they had a chance. So in 2012, they thought they had a chance. 2016, they thought they had a chance. 2021, they did have a chance. And this year, Kevin Durant, as a gray beard, was the guy who you can argue the best stretch or the most critical stretch, with all apologies to Steph and LeBron, was against Serbia with KD hitting the first of two threes. Booker mm -hmm. following it up. That was a four, you know, a six-point swing in what, like five seconds. And then Katie's walk down right, left to right cross and pull like the shot that basically as soon as it left his hands, we said, oh, yeah, that's going in. Like we all knew. Th that was the biggest play of this. Those were the biggest plays of this entire tournament. And they were authored by Kevin Durant. I think we get so wrapped up. And I talked about it a little bit uh, with Rouse Gold on Wood Aid when she was here uh, most recently. We get so wrapped up in all the other things with Kevin Durant and just the fact that he's such a fabulous basketball player that even in like we thought about, you know, Stephen Curry playing with a shorter line, Kevin Durant playing with a shorter line, like easy, th no easy defense, money. no pun intended. He's, he's so easy to coach that you don't coach him. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I think to some degree that's probably worked against him a little bit in some in some spaces because oh Kevin's going to be okay but nah man you got to cater to that dude and I think that's you know that that's he he's just he's fabulous it's just hard to contextualize now James you said you were born in 1992 mm -hmm. on this very rundown you can thank John Gennaro for it right John says how does this team stack up against the dream team and the redeem team Here's what I will do. I will give I will give James the cheat sheet. Okay, yeah. James? Yep. In 92, despite Bur you know, you had Bird with a bad back, you had Stockton with a broken leg, you had Isaiah Thomas not there for, you know, bald reasons, right? <laughs> you had Christian Leitner there as your college player. So with that being said, you had nine players, in my opinion. You had nine. 12-man roster, but nine guys. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, Jordan, Pippen, Drexler, Magic, Charles, Ewing, Robinson, Carl Malone. Like, you had nine guys. Maybe I'm missing. Maybe Chris Mullen. I feel like, there we go. Nine guys. Yeah, Chris Mullen. So, nine guys in the 40-minute game, and none of the games were going to be in doubt. With the Redeem team, the last three guys on that team were Michael Red, Tayshaun Prince, and Carlos Boozer. Yes. That was 10, 11, 12. In this team, you could argue 10, 11, and 12 were Derek White, Jason Tatum, Tyrese Halliburton. Yep. But as far as one through nine, if you're just saying one through nine, does this team begin to stack up or, or considering that LeBron's a gray beard, KD's a gray beard, Steph's a gray beard, that those guys don't quite match up with the Redeem team or quite match up with the 92 Dream team? Man, that's a great question. Um, when you think about the 92 team, as you rattle off each name, I'm just like top 50 player, top 50 player, top 50 player, top 50 player, top 50 player. I look at this team and... If you tell me when it's all said and done, three of them are top 10 all time, I'm not going to argue with you. If you tell me Embiid, even Edwards, Tatum, when it's all said and done, are top 50 all time, I don't think you're probably, I don't think you're, you're crazy. You're not stretching it. Not stretching it. You could even throw 
Anthony Davis is a weird one in there, right? Uh, I yeah. think he's one of those guys that'll weirdly get lost with time, uh, unfortunately. But what I think it goes down to comes down to is what you said earlier. The competition is far more fierce now. And this team had what? One real scare? Yeah. Like yeah. maybe, yeah. right? Yeah. Um Serbia was a real scare. Serbia, Serbia was, was a, a real, real scare. scare. This was like okay, stop turning the ball over, Steph. That's what this was. And then Steph's like, okay, I got you. And just hit a bunch I'll of just threes. shoot. Yeah, I'll just shoot. Forget right. passing. I'll just shoot. Exactly. I think bar for bar, player for player, 92. But I think what this group did, blending the new and the old, I think you can say what you want about Kerr and the situation with Tatum, whatever. I think this is like a trend, obviously very clearly a transition period for USA basketball. Mm -hmm. And included in that are LeBron, KD, and probably Steph playing for something. KD is a weird one because Phoenix at least still has Devin Booker and it could, you never know, I guess, but for what we all feel, or I'd say most of us feel playing for something meaningful for the last time. And that's kind of the overarching theme of this group. Like I think, what they did was very impressive um, and as impressive as any USA team of my like conscious life. And uh, to say, yeah, to compare it to the 92, I think that's tough, but uh, I think this group and what they accomplished was as uh, fascinating, entertaining and uh, successful as, as any group in my 32 years on earth for sure. Through the 92 team has Scotty Pippen on it. That's the one demerit that they have. They had Scotty Pippen on it. I can't believe they asked Scotty Pippen his opinion on who he wanted to play with on the damn dream team. How dare you? Should have been carrying bags. Do you cringe anyway. when you see Scotty now? Huh? Do you, do you cringe like when you see Scotty now? Is it rough? For, like, I just, like, he was courtside and I'm just like. Yeah, it's, it's a little weird, right? It's weird, yeah. It's a little weird. Know. It's. it's it doesn't. It doesn't. You know. But Stephon Marbury was courtside. You know what I mean? Like it's. It's. Yeah. It's. It's. It's all time. We're not nothing against Steph. Like I'm not. No shade yeah, to no. Steph. But Carmelo's courtside. Dwayne Wade's on the call. You know. Like it's. It's a little. It's a little different. You know. You, you know see what I mean? Scotty with dreads and it's just. I don't know. Yeah. It's just. It. Shout it out to Scotty. You can. You can shout out Scotty. You <laughs> live in Detroit. You need to learn the rules, dog. <laughs> I mean, listen. I don't. I, I might run into Scotty, so I'm. Gonna, I'm gonna shout Scotty out. Look, I worked in Chicago, and I and I and I was talking about the migraine headache and sitting bull. Okay, I have zero. There's no sacred cows here, dog. No sacred cows. But I you know. brought up I know how you roll. But you brought up Steve Kerr, and I wanted to I wanted to go there because that man had a losing job. He yes. had a losing proposition of a job that he will never get credit for. Because they were like, "Oh man, he's got something to do with Jason Tatum sitting down. He doesn't like Jason Tatum." Hey, dog. He had arguably the two best small force to ever play sandwiched in between Larry Bird. Like, can we have some perspective here? As great as Jason Tatum is, he's not LeBron when LeBron is rested and motivated and only had to play for two and a half weeks. Same thing for Kevin Durant. But I felt like it was a thankless job. And the other part of this is, you know, Ty Lue's on that squad, on that coaching staff. You know, you know, Eric Spoelstra is on that coaching staff. Like, yeah. Those dudes are also pretty damn good. If I'm if I'm Steve Kerr, I'm more worried about Eric Spoelstra and Ty Lue taking my job right. more than I am worried about Jason Tatum and, or and Jason Tatum's mama tweeting about my baby not playing. Jason we're Tatum's mama both, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't what Jason Tatum's mama wouldn't bench LeBron James for her baby. No, like, let's be perfectly wouldn't. honest here. She was just doing what mom's got to do. Is that what it was? Yeah, I mean, also I just think she's probably. I think we do have to put it in perspective. She's probably never in her life seen Jason Tatum not play in a basketball game that she was at. And so, I understand that, right? And especially you factor in he just won the world championship? Yeah, don't say world championship. I'm, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Because Noah Lyles, yeah, Noah Lyles will yeah. come down from the rafters and cough on us <laughs> and, and cough on us and say, world champions of what? You yeah, know what okay. really hurts the most? 
Them dudes walking around with tats that say world champions. What the NBA got to do with you, fool? Yeah, Why so, the NBA hurting you? That dude. Go quarantine, dog. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You, you, you're right. Go. Keep going. He, But to, back to my point, I just think I could understand from her perspective, like Tatum's been the man any time Mama Tatum is in the gym, right? And yeah, you factor yeah, yeah. in what he just accomplished with the Celtics. Like, I understand it. Now, taking it to Twitter is a bit much, whatever. But I agree with you. Like, did I think Tatum should have? Like, I tweeted it's weird watching a basketball game and seeing Jason, T- that Jason Tatum is healthy and him not playing. Not saying that I agree that he shouldn't, should or should not play. It's just weird because he's one of the best 15 players in the NBA. Absolutely. So it's just a weird thing to see, right? Like he's not – I understand why Tyrese Halliburton is not playing, right? I understand – Well, you don't like Tyrese Halliburton. I do like Tyrese Halliburton. Do I think he's a little overrated? Yeah, I do a little bit, but he's a good player. He's a really age good player. Age on crime. Go ahead. No, shout out to Ty- – Tyrese had the tweet of the year. Uh, <laughs> he did. He that did. Was fin- that was fantastic. I love Tyrese, like his personality. I think he's a great player. I just think he does have flaws to his game. Um, and I understand why he's not playing. I understand why Derek White maybe didn't play, right? Tatum's hard to wrap your head around, but you also have to factor in, like you said, he's playing alongside two of the best small forwards in basketball who can also, in this today day and age, play a lot of their minutes at power forward. And when Tatum checked in, he played power forward, and he actually had a good possession on Wimby in the first uh, his first stint. Yeah, That was about yeah. it. But um, listen, it is what it is. I thought Kerr... I made jokes like everybody else, but like that's a lose lose situation, like you said. Somebody, I think there is value in having a rhythm and letting guys know if they're going to play or not going to play. Um, of course, like he could have maybe found a way to have play everybody all the time, but it's like uh, then you risk, yeah, like I said, you risk not guys, guys not being in a rhythm, guys not being able to like get warm. Right. But then it's also like, okay, you play one game, you're not playing the next game. Like, I'm sure they know days in advance. Just be, both of us being around NBA coaches, a lot of guys tend to be pretty upfront with players right. um, in that regard. So, listen, they won. At the end of the day, they won in an entertaining fashion. If your biggest gripe is how he handled his rotation of eight top 100 players of all time, like, okay. I, I get it, I guess. It wasn't, like, beautiful, but it's like, all you, all Kerr had to do is not mess it up, and you know what? He didn't mess it up, so he did his job. Well, he's much maligned on Twitter, like for whatever reason, Twitter be on Steve Kerr's ass. Like it's so weird. He, like white privilege does not apply to Steve Kerr. No. Like he does not get the benefit of the doubt in any way, shape, or form. Like, and it's not just a certain sect. It's like everybody, like, man, he don't know what the hell he's doing. You had someone come up and create an AI uh, sound of LeBron and Kevin Durant oh, talking yeah. about Steve Kerr can't coach. That was fake, y'all. I hope y'all realize that was fake. Yeah. That wasn't real. Don't get fooled by these AIs, even though they they are getting better yeah, in a we weird way. Something. We need to get laws in place Absolutely. And for that stuff. If we're going to say that the world is catching up, if we're going to say we have to build an actual team and not an all-star team, you can't be mad at USA Basketball for building an actual team that has stars and a few role players and those role players filling in in those spots. Like Derek White had some moments in this. Like Derek White had real moments. Drew Holiday had real moments in this. Now I will say this, James Edwards, when that schedule comes out next week and we see Boston go to L.A., I mean Boston go to Golden State and back and forth, (laughs) and they go to L.A. and then they go to Miami, there will be limo sent. You know what happens when you send a limo, James? I do, but I want to hear you say it. The limo means Jason Tatum is going to send a limo for Steve Kerr. And in it will not just be Steve Kerr and Eric Spolstra and Ty Lue. It will be whomever occupies the position of wingman for said teams. Because <laughs> Jason Tatum cannot light up Steve Kerr in this current form. Jason Tatum can only light up who plays for the small forward for said teams. Bring that, get their asses to the arena on time. Bring your ass. Bring your ass. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. It's a 50 ball with your name on it. Just accept wait. it. I can't wait. And no, you're you're right. And I love that motivation. And I, I'm, That's cool, with I was, yeah, I'm cool, cool with it. I'm cool with it. And I was kind of hoping that I was ha- glad that it didn't really work out, but I was glad that Steve gave Tatum minutes. Like, I want to give the pissed off 
top five MVP guy who's not playing. Like, let me just throw him in there and see how pissed off he is, right? It didn't work. I'm fine with it. I wanted to see it last game when I thought Ant was struggling. Um, but he didn't do it. Ant. Ant. Ant sneakily kind of had a bad, like, he didn't play well the last two games. But I'm with you. I'm not No, he didn't. Ant. No, he didn't. He didn't play well. He had some moments he played Defensively, well. Defensively, yeah. he was in 40 A's. That first, yes. <laughs> he couldn't yes. get he couldn't get the ball past half court. But yeah, man, the whole Tatum thing, it is what it is. Uh, there was there's always an odd man out. Uh, it feels like it. it's just weird that it was him at that time. Like if if Tatum lost the finals, we're not we're not. This is I don't think this is a conversation, right? I think because Tatum's another one that's kind of a lightning rod for weird criticism um, online. And I think people are just kind of feeding it. Oh, he just won. Like, that's crazy. But Kerr's the weird one because, like, I see a section of, like, Warriors fans who, like, think Kerr can't coach. Right. And whether it's because he just didn't play Kaminga enough or Moses Moody enough the last two years, like, man, Steve packed it. He didn't pack it in, but he packed it in a, a few years ago as soon as Clay went down and they knew it wouldn't be the same. Like, this is – that man can coach. That man helped transform – um basketball that man helped put together one of the uh, best teams in runs that we've ever seen like steve kerr is a very 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 good basketball coach and like you said Vinny, we and we're both on record on on wax and on writing saying that we both think eric spolstra and ty Lue are the two best coaches in the world uh coaching basketball right now so uh i agree it like close. It and ain't it ain't that close, close. those two are close. something different those two are different. Yeah, and good. Trust me. We both live in Detroit. I covered the team where, or I will name for you my head coaches. I'm sure if I've done it before, but I will name my head coaches that I've covered as a Detroit Pistons beat writer, and you will tell me who Lucky the best years. coach is. Kids. Okay. I, I went from uh, John Kuster. Go look him up. Go Google. Go Google Q. Google Philly Freedom 2011. Go Google him. Lawrence Frank who's now the top executive with the Clippers. Go figure that out. Uh, Maurice Cheeks. Mo Cheeks, which is the name of a... Which would be the great name of an old stripper. Mo Cheeks, <laughs> right? Yes, it will. Uh, John Lawyer, who filled in. And then Stan Van Gundy. Those were the coaches that I had to deal with. I guess coaches. I'm not saying it's men yeah. or anything like that. I'm just saying it's coaches. So when I see Eric Spostra and I see Ty Lu, I see Wizards. I see Wizards of Oz. I see Steve Kerr. Oh, that's a damn good coach. And y'all be tripping. But we're going to take our last ad break and we'll be right back on the other side. We're going to talk about 2028 in L.A. Welcome back to The Good Word here with James Edwards of The Athletic. James, we got to spin this a little bit for it because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Victor Wimbanyama does not look like he wants to lose in Los Angeles in four years. Who knows what's going to happen in the world and everything else. But the world has caught up and it took a Herculean performance from the Greybeards. It took a Herculean performance from the old dudes, from Steph, from Katie, from LeBron, all at different levels and different points. So now we're looking forward at 2028. Maybe Anthony Davis is gone. Like LeBron hedges a little bit, Katie hedges a little bit, but those dudes going to be old and you shouldn't be depending on these dudes anyway. I don't even know, James, I don't know how you feel about this. If the Olympics across the board, a friend of the show, Bomani Jones, has brought this up numerous times and said there should be an age limit on participation should be under 23 oh wait he thinks it should be under i mean that'd be across fun. the board not just usa basketball yeah, yeah, but yeah. under 23 as far as fiba let's do 25 and i'm with him i like i, I i'm for an age limit yes i would that'd be fun so even and that would mean we get one more run of victor right we yep which which means chet holmgren pack your lunch pack your <laughs> lunch pack your breakfast pack your dinner all of that. Limo, the limo's getting sent. <laughs> yes, it is. Big Big Slim is sending a limo for you. And believe it or not, Chet is going to be trying to order that same limo for Big Slim. Because I don't yes, think he got no back down, right? Nah, shout out to Chet. So when you look at the 2028 team, possibly, can you even begin to workshop a few of the names? Like, Of course, guys are going to come into the league. You may wind up seeing Cooper Flagg or maybe the Boozer Twins or someone like that. But even then, they're, they're still gonna be really, really young before yeah. they make their mark. But do you see a U.S. existing team in L.A. of all places, James, that can really contend or really lead for a gold medal? I mean, names that come to mind, obviously, the, the likes of Anthony Edwards, mm -hmm. uh, Tyrese Halliburton, 
uh, Jason Tatum will only be what thirty. I thought he was nineteen. Next... Oh yeah, I forgot he'll only be twenty three. You're right. Jason Tatum's nineteen. Good call. There you go. Um, maybe Jalen Brown. We'll see. I don't. I don't think Grant Hill would have a problem picking Jalen Brown. I think he like went on wax and said he can still consider him. Yeah, I mean we'll see where Jalen's at that point in his career. But you you wonder about Trey Young. No. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I don't. I don't either. Uh, like you said, Cooper Flag. Then you look at guys like J Dub in Oklahoma City. Like I think he would very much play. Oh yeah. Like he would play a fun role in this, where he's not like quite a Derek White role, but like a Derek White type role. Even though he, I th- he'll end up. I think he'll end up being a better player than Derek White. Not. I yeah. Think Derek yeah. White's a really good player. Cade will be interesting, right? Like I think we talked about it before the show. Like how many players on bad teams make the Olympic team? Uh, obviously, four years away, anything could change. Uh, but Cade, I think, has – I think Steve Kerr is a fan of Cade. Not saying yeah. that Kerr will be the coach then, but he provides a lot of uh, some of the nuance in his game, being big ball handler, being able to kind of methodically uh, get to his spots. I think even the fee- he would shoot even better from the FIBA line, uh, Cade. Uh, then you look at guys like – who else we missed? Don't forget him? about Ja. Ja, yes. Ja would be fun. I forgot about Ja. Do we? Is Jaron Jackson still twenty four years old? He's a hack master, man. That dude he just is. fouls. What? What is it about Michigan State where oh, no. y'all big Here people? Like for y'all don't know, don't know. James Edwards is a Michigan State alum, yes. which means green, that he has burned a couch or three in his day. <laughs> that was now, before I'm, my time. Y'all was still burning couches like ten years ago, dog. Well, that was because the football team was the best in the country for like my whole time there so yeah we were kind of getting rowdy there best in the country I'm, they were one of the best in the country see, from see 2010 what I'm saying? to four, 16 i graduated from 14 but. do y'all see how he changed the verbiage as soon as he got canceled he said one of the best he said best in the country my bad i swear that was u of m this past year oh, who kicked God. everybody's ass my bad i remember michigan state the, the, I'm in Michigan State, not getting the first down in a national uh, in a national semifinal against Alabama. All I know you remember is that, that game, James. You remember I that? do, but I, do, I, do you remember where the the Fab uh, the Fab Five banners are tucked away in a Chrysler Center basement? Those uh, that's all good, like baby. Last them year's banner exist, might dog. join it too. Them, them tapes <laughs> exist, dog. Jalen Rose wiping his ass on the Spartan S exists. Y'all can't take that away, <laughs> man. Can't you? <laughs> You can't right, back back on top. You can't take no 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 no. You can't change the subject here. See, this is what happens, y'all. This is what when you let a friend over and he grinds his feet into your couch and then he gets mad that you tell him to clean it up. That's what happens with James <laughs> Edwards, dog. He is trying to hijack the conversation, man. But no, I get your point. I, I don't know why I did that with you. That was that's that's a rookie move from somebody who literally does it every time I'm with you. I should, that was on me. You set Is me up. Pop. You set me up. I like I that. Did. I set you up. Evan Mobley. Ooh. If Should Evan Mobley, he has to gain weight, right? Because these dudes are big dudes. Yeah. Like Chet is going to be there, right? Like we've we've said, Chet is going to be there. But I don't know from a standpoint of girth if the U.S. has the girthy dudes that will contend with some of these foreign guys because this is a physical game. Like, Bam should maybe still be there. Anthony Davis will be 34. You don't know if he'll come back. But, yeah, they need some big dudes. We talked about even Jalen Duran. Yeah, just to have the size. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility, right? And he's been in the Team USA system since, I mean, since younger than he's gotten in the league. But, obviously, he's been working with them in the summers. Uh, Devin Booker will be back, too. No way he might be the old head. He, yeah, he, he might, might be, be the old head. He might be the vet. And this better be Anthony Edwards' team in four years. Like, yes. if it's not his team, then something went terribly wrong. Yep. Like, maybe he got caught shooting off pistols or something like that. Who the hell knows? But hopefully that doesn't happen because this is America's last hope. You got Anthony Edwards on one side. You got Cooper Flag on another side. We have two Americas all taken up. You got whatever you need, dog. We got whatever you need. You got the Cooper flag types in the world, and then you got the Ant-Mans, the Atlantas of the world. We have everything covered except big dudes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) is my man, James Edwards. Don't forget to check him out on The Athletic. He is the Pistons beat writer, and he does a bunch of great creative stories. We also do a podcast together called Detroit Players. 
you can get that on Patreon. Uh, thanks, James, for riding with me on this show on a late Saturday night and early Sunday morning, wherever you guys get it, man. I appreciate you, bro. Hey, man, anything for you. I appreciate you asking me, bro. Hey, thanks to producer John and the entire team who worked so hard behind the scenes on this show. Jake and Dan will be back for another episode of No Cap Room on Wednesday. I'll be back. I'm supposed to be back next week, but I don't know if I am because I want to take a vacation. Maybe I am. But until then, y'all, everybody be safe.